Hello, my name is Angel Stauhunter, and I'm an associate professor of sociology at Ohio Dominican University. Today, I want to start a conversation about transforming OER use through the lens of critical pedagogy. In this lightning talk, we will consider how OERs could contribute to the reproduction of systems of oppression within higher education. We will then examine strategies to transform our use of OERs to advance social justice in our classrooms and within our institutions. This presentation draws on recent scholarship around pedag critical pedagogy OERs and higher education, but I want to be sure to especially highlight the work of Ian McDermott and Sarah Krasinger, both of whom published influential articles in the open access, open peer reviewed journal um, in the library with the lead pipe, which is a resource that I highly recommend and I am drawing specifically on McDermott's open to what a critical evaluation of OER efficacy studies. I am sure that many of us attending the conference are likely aware of what an OER is, but just as a refresher, OER is actually an umbrella term for a variety of materials, um, teaching, learning, and research materials that are either in the public domain or licensed in a manner that provides everyone free and perpetual permission to use in a number of ways. And generally, we classify those ways in terms of the five R's, and those are retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. What I want to emphasize here, though, is that the OER movement um, was not intended for oppression. In fact, it was rooted in positive principles that encourage access to education and inclusion. So as early as 2002, the term OER was coined by UNESCO's Forum on Open Courseware based on principles such as everyone has a right to education and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 26.1. Additional international work, such as the Paris OER Declaration of 2012, made a number of recommendations, including fostering awareness and use of OERs to encourage research support and capacity for building quality OERs. In the U.S., we've seen an increasing popularity in the usage of OERs from 2016 to 2017. For example, we saw an increase of 5% of classes using OERs to 13%, and that number continues to rise today. Generally, the benefits of adopting an OER um, center around kind of three broad areas, cost savings, student outcomes, and pedagogical advantages. As we consider those benefits of adopting an OER, I would like us to take a step back and apply a critical approach to the current adoption within a system of higher education. So as Krisinger um, urges us to do, Openness, when disconnected from its political underpinnings, could become as exploitative as a traditional system it had replaced. Furthermore, McDermott argues, replacing an expensive textbook with a free one is not critical pedagogy because expensive textbooks are one symptom of higher ed's disease. Higher ed is a system that operates under a capitalist model which values profit maximization and private ownership. In doing so, there is a bit of disconnect between this idea of openness within a political system that tends to encourage private ownership and profit maximization. So if we look at the benefits of adopting an OER, a critical approach allows us to situate our understanding of OER in the larger political, historical, and social context in which there are systems of dominance that are reproduced. We can't assume that the benefits are evenly distributed within this system. Furthermore, how do said benefits get co-opted or morphed into mechanism for perpetuating systems of oppression? So I'd like to ask a few questions in light of our benefits. Cost savings, to whom? Student, in terms of student outcomes, who benefits and why? And in terms of pedagogical advantages, at what cost to the instructor? When we think about cost savings, we have to consider the question, what is the relationship between OERs and the textbook publishing industry? And textbook publishing industry is a powerful 
profitable, and increasingly concentrated industry. In fact, five publishers control 80% of the textbook market. A textbook that sells is often a textbook with fancy covers and famous offers that, authors that speaks to a dominant narrative. Textbook companies are responding to OER usage, and part of that response has been through reducing cost of textbooks, which is a positive response, providing incentives for inclusive access and courseware for open access resources. For example, Cengage and Macmillan are shifting to development of online resources based on OER textbooks. And I think that that is something that is worth critically examining and considering, does that defeat our purpose of open access? So. Additionally, are publishers pushing a narrative that OER is less than the traditional textbooks and that we need publishers to come in and kind of save the day with these extra resources? Students do indeed save money, and there's a number of resources that um, talk about student savings. However, when we think about students saving money through the use of OERs, uh, two critical questions that we might consider are, are OERs perpetuating perpetuating the model of the student as a consumer? And are institutions using student savings as a way of making profits by retaining students? And then in our next point, are we valuing profit over access? So are OERs used as a source of branding and marketing for universities? And um, could OERs be leveraged as a way to um, cost as a cost saving measure for institutions and one study uh, Bowen at all 2012 actually looked at OERs as a potential model for reducing instructor costs to uh, percent again aspect of benefits that we can look at critically is the student outcomes piece so early research on student outcomes kind of further uh, focused on whether there was a disadvantage to using an OER. And that research consistently found that there was not a disadvantage to using an OER, that there were similar student outcomes in classes that used OERs compared to classes that used traditional textbooks. Recently, research has began to look at who benefits most from OER um, adoption with a social justice emphasis. And here are three recent studies that demonstrate underserved, marginalized, and lower socioeconomic groups have more significant gains when OERs are implemented within the classroom. What I would argue, though, is that we don't have enough of this type of research. So all three of these articles argue that more research is needed on the social justice implications of OER use. And furthermore, that research needs to better understand the mechanisms by which OER reduces inequality. Is it only an access issue or are there other mechanisms at place in the implementation of OER use? Finally, pedagogical advantages um, do happen and a number of pedagogical advantages are highlighted in the OER literature. But what those pedagogical advantages often leave out is what is the cost to the instructor? So McDermott argues that um, OER use has the potential to increase the invisibility of labor, and OERs are not a substitute for an adequately funded and staffed education system. Al Furrier argued, urged a co-construction of a curriculum. So how better to do that than through, through open educational resources and the construction of those resources? So a critical pedagogical response to OER use might ask some of these questions. Are we using OER to increase diverse voices? OER has the potential to bring in voices and perspectives that are not traditionally valued or upheld within higher education, but that has to be done so in an intentional way. Are we using OER to empower students are we measuring, compensating, and valuing OER work as work? Are we considering how OERs can facilitate the exchange of information globally 
or merely seeing OER as a vehicle for dumping knowledge look like? To apply critical pedagogy in our use of OERs in the classroom and at the institutional level, I want to provide five ideas for um, ways we might think about our OER use in light of a critical pedagogy. Idea one is to evaluate our OERs in terms of diversity of voices. One of the key advantages of OER is its ability to adapt, modify, and glean material from diverse perspectives. I chose an OER textbook to use in my introduction to sociology class. It is a lengthy and comprehensive OER introduction to sociology textbook that is 800 pages long. I do not use all 800 pages. <laughs> However, of those 800 pages, only three are devoted to rural life. And uh, similar to traditional textbooks in introduction to sociology, there is a strong urban bias. And so one of my goals as an instructor is to actually bring in more of a discussion of rural life, to bring in more of a spatial component to sociology. And so as I'm thinking about my use of this textbook, I think about supplementing to accommodate or to bridge the gap in those areas that are often missed in the textbook. Idea two. And I believe that this is where the OER movement is headed, and I think many of you all agree, but can we encourage students to not only consume OERs, but to evaluate and create OERs? So my initial use of OER was uh, the traditional, I'm going to take out my textbook, I'm going to find an OER textbook, I'm going to replace that textbook with, a, with an OER textbook. There's so many other avenues for using OERs. So um, we could encourage students to write their own Wikipedia article. We could encourage students to actually evaluate an OER resource. Idea three is to join the OER community. And part of that we're doing through this conference, obviously. Um, but realizing that we too are not just consumers of OERs, but we are part of a community in which we are responsible for um, attributing properly and for contributing properly to that community. A fourth consideration is, are we considering barriers to implementing OERs among our least resourced individuals? Are we giving the burden of our OER work to those individuals who are not getting paid or rewarded? Have we found a way to measure and compensate the use and development of OER resources? And finally, the conference has encouraged that we adopt a care framework. I think that this care framework aligns very nicely with critical pedagogy. So the care framework, C-A-R-E, includes contribute, attribute, release, and empower, developed in 2018 by Petrus, Levine, and Watson. That care framework really can encapsulate the other four aspects of what I've recommended here. Obviously, in a 15-minute presentation, I cannot um, cover everything there is, but I would love to continue this conversation thinking about ways that we can think critically about our use of OERs and ways that OERs can transform our classroom and allow us to engage in critical pedagogy in meaningful ways. So uh, let's chat in Discord. I'll see you there.